And we are back. And we just finished watching 2018's Wolfman's Got Nards, which clocks in at one hour and 31 minutes. This is the documentary that explores a little bit about the Monster Squad, the people who started it and who worked on it, and also its wonderful, wonderful fan base. This is available on Plex, Pluto, and Tubi, but also to buy rent from Amazon Prime. Actually, Prime Video. Is there a difference between Amazon Prime and Prime Video? I meant to ask you that because sometimes I look at stuff on the IMDb page and sometimes it says Amazon Prime and sometimes it says Prime Video. I think if it's Prime Video, it's rent and buy. Whereas if it's just Amazon Prime, that means it's it's free to watch. From the streaming. Okay. It's, it's part of your membership. Oh, uh, okay. All right. Fair enough. I this, think I'm, I could just be making it up. This is directed by Andre Gower, who was Sean in the original Monster Squad movie from 18, 1987, with writing credits to Andre Gower and Henry Darrow McComas. This is a documentary. So this is explores again a little bit about the film itself making of the, the making of the film uh, it talks failure to of the, the failure of the film the it talks to the creators the cast the crew which did a phenomenal job with a lot of the practical effects in this film mm-hmm. and monster making and then also you meet some of these diehard fans, which you just can't help but smile about because that is amazing. A movie that came out in 1987 still has an impact on people. Yeah. I mean, I never, I actually have never seen the monster squad. So it, it it's surprising to see, you know, a lot of people's lives were like really touched by this movie. And people was, are naming their kids after characters, kids tattoos. tattoos. <laughs> I mean, they're, yeah. This Going to these events, knowing that they can't watch the film because their country has some crazy law that says they can't see a film unless they're 15. Yeah. That is weird that the rating that it got in 87 still, still impacts to yeah. today. Yeah. Because I, I mean, I've never seen it, but I'm going to wager that any sort of stuff that was going on in the monster squad is probably tame by by today's today's standards. standards. Absolutely. Absolutely. What'd you think? Uh, I thought the documentary was good. It it really gave a good, you know, overview of the entire thing, the, the making of the film, it's eventual failure. It's funny. I mean, it was written by Shane black who like wrote, lethal weapon and well that came after did you hear what the guy said the guy was like they had held on to this for like another year they could have been like from the guy who wrote lethal weapon and that would have been the built-in audience would have brought in brought in a whole bunch of people yeah when they were showing like the uh the the box office like disorderlies i think made more money than this which is so (laughs) sad because i okay so i saw this in the theater And I think I may have seen it like on channel 11 or one of those things, but I never went back to it. And this was also one of those movies that it really envelops you in this sense of nostalgia, kind of, where they address this in the documentary. Like this film really spoke to so many people because it didn't dumb down things for people. The kids weren't like stupid. They were smart. They were brave. And like, I I forgot who, but a couple of people mentioned like this script was like how my friends and I would talk. So that was another thing that they gravitated towards because it was like, this represents me. And also the takeaway of the takeaway of like just being the outcast, being the outsider and how this group of friends finds their footing finds their bravery and ultimately defeats the bad that has come to their door yeah well it's it's like that it's got that 80s kids absolutely sort of uh, absolutely environment that does not exist anymore right like unsupervised kids engaging in activities that they probably shouldn't be in (laughs) not, not not only that but like just 
it's not accepted now. I mean, sure. you, uh, kids running around unsupervised, building weird clubhouses in completely hazardous situations. <laughs> now all their parents would be in jail. Yes, yes. Like just for suspicion. It, it's like we've we've reached the level of nanny state that we're just like, <laughs> you can't do this anymore. Little kids can't just like hop on their bike and ride away to their friend's house. No. I mean, I think about the stuff that I did when I was little. I was yeah. like... I was like six and I would just leave the house and, and go I'd, down walk, the block. I'd go down the block, knock on my friend's door and be like, hey, could, can Neil come out and play or can Michael come out and play? And we just play in the street. Yeah. <laughs> Nowadays, a six-year-old kid ain't walking out of the front door yeah, yeah. and going down the block. Before Dyfus is called. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh my God, you're, 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 that, that kid's mother's in jail before yeah. dinner. <laughs> well I, what was that like well not recently but not too long ago weren't we watching like et and we were like d wallace is like the worst mother like this would by never t- by today's standards, standards yeah but back then it was that was the norm yeah i mean yeah. seriously you were allowed to just run around and be a kid yeah and now it's 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 like oh my god but what about all the the child molesters <laughs> I mean, they were probably back there then too, but you know, <laughs> it's it's just like now it's like everybody's a child molester. Yeah, and sure. There's just no safety at all. Well, I mean, the media is fed into that oh, with like uh, their every- Dateline exclusives oh and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> there's a child yeah. molester at every other door. Yeah, it's they're just waiting. It's like yeah. it's like you look. I mean, your, obviously, you look we're at, not making fun of that. But you look at your just, front door, and oh, there's one behind a tree over there. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, yeah, this was a movie from a different time, a different era. Yeah, it's a, like I said, it it it's it's an era that doesn't exist anymore, and it it appeals to a level of nostalgia that I guess it's going to remind people of that time because those times don't exist, and and their kids will never have that. Our kids will never have that. No, no. And you kind of like. Y- you kind of wish they would, sort of. Like, to some extent. To some extent, yeah. because you, you do worry. There definitely, it probably is a bit more dangerous than it was back then. and But there was a level of freedom and innocence when yeah. we were growing up, right? Yeah. But like I said, you just, you're not going to have that. So I guess if as an adult and you want to share that with your kids, the only place you could really share that with your kids is through, through movies. Right. And, and they do make modern stuff now. But stuff that has that sense of the side, it's all 80s, you know. Yeah. I don't even know if like nine, like maybe early 90s, but like that that late 80s sort of, you know, friends riding their bikes. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's that's something that's not around anymore, and it, it's it's sort of. It's sad. It's it's a bit sad, but it, it gives you the the warm feeling in your tum tum. <laughs> Yeah, I but mean, the, back to this movie. Yeah, they explain all that, and uh, like I said, the 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 box office failure that resulted, and the resurgence, and like the the joy that these people have of seeing this film get the recognition that they that they've long felt that it deserved. deserved. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's a very feel good documentary. It's really felt, well done. I felt a little bad for for Fred Decker. Yeah, he, he th- his last comment sounded you, very bitter. You could see there's a bit of bitterness there. Yeah, and maybe it's because I I loved his analogy. It's like it's like you threw a basketball shot in 1987 and it didn't go in until 2006. 2006. Yeah, and maybe it's I don't know if he said that it was the best thing he ever did and it it destroyed his career, career. for a couple of years. years. Yeah. And maybe nowadays it's getting this resurgence, but I doubt he's seeing any sort of financial gain from it at right. all. And, I mean, and, and, that, and that also, whole tour, I don't think he was on that tour. Well, I mean, there, he was in pictures and stuff, but it seems like Andre, Ryan, and is it and Ashley? The other actors were the, the ones. The ones that really helmed up. And even like there's another kid, Patrick, who was one of the talking heads, but he, I don't see, I didn't see him at all in the, um, in like the Alamo presentations that the cast was doing it's it's usually just sean which is the andre gower uh which is andre gower who's also the director for this um and then ryan lambert who played rudy the tough kid and then i think sean's sister 
Yeah, the or little girl. Was it Patrick's little sister? I, the little girl who was Ashley Bank, who played Phoebe. Yeah, it's been a hot minute since I've seen it, so like everyone's jumbled up in my head. But this was definitely one of those movies. Like I think I told you, like this reminded me so much of the woman in white. It had that whole thing about nostalgia and and going back and embr- like you said, embracing this time that no longer exists, but is definitely seared in our minds because we grew up in it. Yeah, but this I I'm. I never saw the Monster Squad, but I, it felt like it was a more fun movie than the Woman in White. The Woman in White. Yeah, no, no, no. It's not a f- fun movie. Fun no movie, in it, and I got to be honest, the title didn't make any sense. Sense? No, no. It had flaws, but it also had its positives. I think yeah. this was one of those movies that should have done better, but didn't. According yeah, to IMDb, I mean, they, they, the, showed, they showed the advertising that they were going with. Which was Statutory cringe. rap. Yeah, which was very that cringe. Was, oh my, yeah. How did that get past the... I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Board. But uh, on a side note, according to IMDb, the estimated budget on this was $12 million, which is not a lot of money, but is, I guess, in 1987. Yeah. The gross opening weekend for this film, $1,920,678. And then the gross worldwide, up to date, is three million seven hundred sixty-nine thousand nine hundred ninety. So it was a financial flop. flop. It was a flop. Yeah, it made a fourth of what it should have. Yeah. Oh well. Yeah. I mean, I I vaguely recall when it came out, and yeah, I don't know. I I I didn't want to see it when I was a little kid. But then again, I. I was stuck watching the movies my mom wanted to watch. Yeah. I I saw this, but I think I saw it towards like the tail end of its run in the cinemas. This wasn't like, it's funny. They mentioned in the documentary, it, it came out and it was a big blockbuster and it was the lost boys. That movie I saw opening weekend. Absolutely. Yeah. I think I remember seeing the lost boys. Yeah. Did I see it in the theater? Maybe I saw it. In the I saw it in the theaters. Yeah, I must have. It was eighty-seven. I was. Yeah. I was old enough to be seeing movies. Yeah, yeah. That film came out two weeks before this one, which is funny because it's it's it is and it isn't the same audience. I think the the Lost Boys is sort of more a little bit more grown up, even though a lot of the main characters for this film or comparable in age to somebody like the Rudy character in this film. So yeah, it's, it's just, it was just one of those things, wrong place, wrong time. Like that guy said, if they had held on to this movie for another six months, they could have banked go. on yeah. Shane yeah. Black's, I guess, fame yeah, from, cred. yeah, from doing the lethal weapon movies. Yeah. Yeah. I also liked a huge component of this film is the fans. They go to talk to a lot of the fans. The guy that has like w- his garage is just basically <clears throat> it's a, all it's, just it's a all boys out, yeah. yeah it's like horror a boys movie, yeah wet dream. It's just a horror movie memorabilia movies. Well, I mean, like horror films, they've definitely. Um, I mean, they always had an audience, but now I think it it kind of exploded in in more popularity with uh, the advent of the internet and and being able to share all this stuff and having it, it's just easier to be a fan and just getting access to stuff. I mean, these people are they're finding like bootlegs of the DVD because right. there wasn't like for the longest time, time there just wasn't a DVD, and the right. only way you'd be able to see this movie is. Like the Japanese laser, yeah, Japanese laser disc copies yeah. and, and things like that, yeah. and and uh, I guess the off chance that they put it on HBO. I mean, that's where a lot of these people, people saw, saw it, it originally. It was yeah, just back in the old days of HBO when it was just here's a movie mm-hmm. we're going to rebroadcast it fifteen times in a row. Right, right, and you know, you're going to watch it. Right, because there's nothing there's else to nothing watch. Nothing else to watch. Right. I mean, back then it was if you it had, was either if you, if you had cable. It wasn't even like you got like a buttload of channels like it is now. Yeah, no. It was like you still had the original seven channels, right? And then you had HBO and maybe one other thing. Yeah, yeah a couple of things on basic cable, and like there was nothing to watch. Really, no, no. So it when, isn't when like you, it is now. Like yeah. now, it's just sensory overload. 
Yeah, no. My God. Oh, this is just too much to watch. We yeah. Can't, we can't even we can't catch keep up, up with any shows. Anymore. Yeah, yeah. But the, I, I, and like the other, the other guy mentioned, like, if you wanted to watch something like this, you either had to buy it, a VHS for like a hundred bucks because you had to get the licensing oh God, yeah. rights or whatever he said, or you rented it. And I think the other reason why this did well on VHS was because Halloween started becoming a thing, but everybody would go to the video stores to get the Halloween movies to play on Halloween. So you kind of had to scrounge for what was left over. So I think this is where this new light for this film also played out because like the girl, the woman who's the professor now, she said she was having a sleepover and she wanted, she was a huge horror fan, but her mother wanted something that wouldn't ter- like terrorize children. Cause it yeah. was still little kids. And she said half of the group was like terrorized and then the other half loved it. Yeah. And this film seems like it would fit that little niche just perfectly. Perfect. It does. It, yeah. You could see, you could see how, this film could be viewed as being too kiddy. And I think that's probably why I never wanted to go see it Mm -hmm. as a kid, because I thought it was just a silly kids movie. Mm -hmm. But then you look and you see like the care and the effort that was made. And it's, there's stuff for true fans of horror. Sure. Especially if you, you love the universal monsters, but now like they've, they've, they like sort of like brought it up to speed a little. I mean, right. that Gilman looks fantastic. 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 I can't wait for you to see it. Yeah. And things are getting blown to pieces. You got a little bit of the, uh, for the gore people. And yeah. they made Dracula menacing. They made Dracula he's menacing. not like this yeah, kind of he's like not this over the top winking. Like I, I, I loved how the, the guy who played it was just like, he wanted like, to get he to the psychology. He, he didn't want to. He didn't want to have it to be like some sort of John Waters type. Rocky horror. Camp, camp. Rocky horror sort yeah. of thing. And, you know, so you, you're towing that sort of line between kids' fair and something a little bit more than that. Mm-hmm. And maybe people couldn't... T- back then, people... I think people wanted one or the other. Right, right. And so this sort of, like, tonal blending probably wasn't appreciated back then. Right, right. At so least not until little kids started watching it and they were able to, like... Really get it. I guess it w- you could sort of consider this sort of like a gateway, maybe. Kind of. I think somebody does say that this is like the gateway drug for horror because it yeah, was like... It, it was, was innocent. Yeah, it's it was, not like... I mean, it's hilarious. Like, you brought it up, too. Like, it's hilarious. Like, the stuff that's horror now. Well, it's funny. But, okay, so I'm sure we've had this conversation before about how horror as a genre, I feel like was very disrespected, but it wasn't because of the fans. I think it was just disrespected because of the makers, because the makers, listen, if you, as a well, child let's, of the let's, 70s. Let's not say the makers, because that you're making it sound like the people who create the things. I'm t- no, I'm no, talking no. About the producers. Studio, studios. Studios. Yeah, studios. They, studios. They, Sorry. They wanted something that would just be like. Bankable. Cheap to make. And make money. And make money. Right. And that's right. that's pretty much what horror films were like when we were younger. Right. I mean, growing you, up in the seventies, it was just like Jamie Lee Curtis, topless, right? Yeah, and that's cheap. You know, I'm not Jamie Lee Curtis is not cheap, <laughs> but it's like, all right, we don't really have to spend a lot of money to get Jamie Lee Curtis to take her top off, and run around scared. <laughs> yeah, she's been doing it for three or four films now. But then, like, as things progressed, and you started getting more of like the fans making these movies yes. and they wanted to sort of take it to the next level. And you have that sort of care and that, that detail. care that you're not going to get from anybody else other than a fan. Yes. Like the, the bakers and the, the Winstons and the, these guys love to make this. They're like, how could we make this look as cool, cool as, as we possible? Can? Yeah. And I'm sure nowadays you, you could probably get, you're throwing out a lot of money for that sure. sort of thing. Sure, sure. But back then, it was like, here's the money. This is all the money we have. Right. Make, make it, something. Make it work. And these people would go above and beyond, beyond to really make this stuff good. And like, okay, a kid nowadays will look at that stuff and be like, oh, that looks so fake. But yeah. back when we were kids, oh, that was just- That was the pinnacle. Oh, my God. Yeah. Did you see, see that? that? The- <laughs> squibs exploding and pustules pulsating yeah yeah it yeah. was awesome we- i mean what 
what was the movie we were talking about the other day? Was it Clash of the Titans with Harry Hamlin? It's like when that movie came out, it was like the pinnacle. I mean, now you watch it and it's like, oh my God, this is yeah. shit. But it's it was so cool at when the you're time. A kid, you're so forgiving of that. Yeah. So now little kids are just like, if it ain't if it doesn't look as polished as like Thanos and, and <laughs> Infinity Wars, <laughs> screw that. Yeah, that I looks don't want so it. So fake and yeah. cheap. And I'm just like, what are you talking, talking about? about? Even like low budget special effects now, I'm just like Man, they, they really took it up. I yeah. mean, even television special effects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They would have sold their soul for that kind of level of detail yeah. back in the 80s. Yeah, yeah. But these guys were just doing it. And for like, I mean, they got paid, but they didn't get paid enough. No, And no. just the love and care, like especially when they were talking about the design of the Gilman suit. Yeah. And the guy who had to put it on. Yeah, yeah. Oh my God, he's locked in a complete latex bodysuit, prison, top to bottom for <laughs> prison. twelve hours, <laughs> and they're like, "All right, now you're in it. Get in a lake. <laughs> Get in a lake and act like a monster. And yeah. then, okay, we're not done with you yet, but we don't need you, so just go in a trailer and fall asleep in the, the suit because <laughs> we're gonna need you later. Oh, and you can't eat." And you probably can't pee, so make sure you get all that stuff done before before we gl- we glue, glue. you into Is it. it. <laughs> and this guy, anybody else would have just been like, "Nah, son, go to hell, man! <laughs> How much am I getting paid for this? <laughs> oh, the, the absolute minimum wage we could, get, we could pay you. Screw off! Oh my god, hilarious, hilarious! Ridiculous. I mean, people really loved. They, um, that's yeah, and then they you could see that, really, yeah. They do it because they love it. Yeah. And, and you could see that. You could absolutely see it. Yeah. Yeah, so it was nice to get, like, like this This film really shows you so much of so many different parts of the filmmaking experience, being in the, in the actor's seat, being in the background as the director and the writer, and then just the fan base. I loved the intersprinkled uh, fan art for the oh, different yeah. little title cards Such of the little. Art, yeah. yeah. Really, really good. Some of it was just like, if I had the money, I'd pay for a print of that to put on my wall. Yeah, honestly, that's, that's what I was thinking. I was looking yeah. at. I was like, some know, of it was really. Of, we always wanted to decorate our house with like more movies. Stuff. Posters, like, yeah. You just find some really cool. Like fan art posters, yeah. Some of that stuff. Some of that brilliant. stuff was amazing. I love amazing. That, like, that's it's sort of like almost Art Deco ish, yeah. Like, portrait of all the monsters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That looked that looked brilliant, and it was hanging in some sort of gallery. Gallery, yeah, yeah. So much of it is just it's great, right? I mean, I I love when it doesn't have to be big, right? It just needs to speak to somebody and connect to somebody in a way and then when you see it connect to other people when you hear the fans talk about it like how it impacted them and the funny story of the girl like oh i i knew what it was like to be phoebe because i was getting bullied by my two big sisters and they're like (laughs) i had to kick everybody's ass in staten island because of you which was hilarious yeah. And then uh, the guy who's like the professor who teaches it to his class and he was yeah. and he kind of brought up like, well, you know, there's there's aspects of this that aren't politically correct now and and you see, what he you hears s- the, the the crowd go silent when they say yeah, certain words words that are, that not, are used and not socially acceptable nowadays. Yeah. And he even like prefaces it like like how would this play now? And even I think Sean uh, Andre, who's Sean, the Sean character in the film, is like, well, I think the main that Phoebe would be Phoebe the main, would be the main character, yeah. right? And there would be more diversity in in the kids because all the kids in this particular movie are white. But it's still the universal experience of being young and being unsupervised. Unsupervised, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I think Shane Black made an, a comment about how this was like Spielberg meets well, like the. Fred Decker was the one who came up with the story idea, and this came about from watching all those Abbott and Costello meet the mummy and Dracula and the wolf man and all that stuff. So this is this is kind of like residual imagination kind of from his perspective, but it worked. It worked. And you do feel bad for them that this movie didn't do or didn't get the love that it, it should have. I mean, you see it in his... 
you hear it in his voice. You see it on his face when he's talking about going to that theater in the valley and there were only seven other people yeah. in a theater that seats 300. I mean, that has That's got to be devastating. And the kid who played Patrick, who doesn't go on the tour, but he was a talking head earlier in the film, basically said just didn't want to relive any of that. And also, I think the Rudy the the guy who played the Rudy character, Ryan Lambert, also was like, I would never mention it. It yeah. was one of those things that like I just suppressed because it was such a it was a great it's experience deep, yeah. for them, but it was such a financial flop that it wound up impacting their I guess their careers. I don't think they've I don't know if any of them actually have careers in cinema now, but I don't know. I should probably look that up, but yeah, it definitely seems like they all kind of went in different directions. And it was also cool to see how makers are impacted and influenced. You have the guys who either started their own zines or film critic on websites or who run festivals, like the guy, the guys that do Alamo Draft House, where this kind of... So it's, it's began its, its resurgence. Be, began its resurgence. So it's it's and even the guys who work in FX now doing monsters and and creatures and stuff like that and how they cite this movie as like such a pivotal thing to them and the guy and again like you were saying like the Gill Man like that suit was really cool and listening to those two guys that created that and how just. I guess being young men, like being scared that they lived up to this potential because they're working under the great Stan Winston. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's a, it's a very interesting look at behind the scenes of, of, of this, this particular movie. Yeah. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. I, I think I originally caught it on Showtime. It was on at a really ungodly hour and unfortunately it wasn't being replayed. So I, forced myself to stay up and watch I think 80% of that film but then I went to bed I was like oh it's after two in the morning I have to get to bed and I have work tomorrow so I'm glad that we found it and we're able to watch it again today and I'm thank you for sitting with me and doing that yeah that was uh, fun I, though I look forward to actually watching the movie I look forward to sharing that with you I think I think it, and it's one of those things like I said it, it reminded me when I saw the documentary, it reminded me of the film and I was like, oh, that was, that was one of those things that was like, oh, that was good. And I just, it sort of flew off my radar kind of thing. Yeah. You don't really hear about it too much. No. I mean, well, I, that's, that's changing part of the, the yeah. cult film status. Yeah. I mean, most people don't really hear about these types of movies. Right. Right. But it's nice to be reminded. And I think that again, that's why I, I kind of wanted to push to get this, on the list of stuff to watch because I, I really enjoy it. But I wanted you to see the documentary first because I didn't think the documentary spoiled too much of it, but it still gave you a lot of it. And it was just nice that it was told from so many different vantage points, again, from the creative side, from the acting side, from the technical background creators to even the fan base. And it's just, it's done in such a, a lovely way. I mean, I think that, as far as documentaries go, this one was, when you think of documentaries, it's basically just talking heads, but this is done in such a way that's impactful and interesting with the mesh of the fan art and stuff. So I, if I was going to give this a number from one to 10, I think I would give this an eight, actually. I think it's a really, really well done documentary. And if it gets you interested in actually going out to see the Monster Squad, even better. Because I think that that's one of those films that unfortunately, because of circumstance, just didn't do well at the box office, but was lucky enough to get a resurgence. And through the fan love has pro like propelled this particular project from Andre Gower. So hats off to everyone involved. What a fun, fun, like revisit down memory lane. Again, if you haven't seen it, definitely go check out. Wolfman's Got Nards from 2018. One to ten, what would you give this film? Uh, I think I'd give it a seven. Seven? Yeah. Yeah. It's, I, I, I mean, it's it. worth watching. It. Yeah, it's definitely worth watching. Do you Especially think... Especially if you're a fan of, of that Of movie. the film, yeah. Do you think 
Well, you haven't seen the film yet, so I was going to say, do you think it would have been better? Well, you know what? When you see the film, I'm going to ask you this question. So I'll hold it for then. Okay. All right. So that is it from us. Again, if you haven't seen it, go check out Wolfman's Got Nards from 2018, one hour, 31 minutes. From Andre Gower, director who is also the Sean character in the original Monster Squad from 1987. This is currently playing on Plex TV and what else did I say? Pluto TV, but also to buy rent from Amazon Video. Prime Video. Excuse me. I think you can also get it on YouTube too. Yes, I believe so. I think there's a, a decent print of it on YouTube. Okay, well, that's it from us, and we will bid you all a good night. Good.